In Italy, the territories of the Medici family extended 50 miles west of Florence to the quarries in the Appuan Alps above Carrara. The peaks are made of solid marble. The great blocks of stone were lowered by ropes and runners to the valleys below. They were used to embellish the palaces and cathedrals of the Renaissance, and this is where Michelangelo came to get the marble for his sculptures. Sculptors still come here from all over the world. In 1957, Henry Moore was working in the studios of the Enro Quarry Company. They brought him here to Altissimo, the highest peak from which the famous pure white marble comes. Inspired by this scene at Carrara, he made his summer home nearby. It was close to the stone yards and the workshops and also within easy reach of Florence. The associations of Michelangelo, Florence and the mountains of Carrara have lingered in his mind for many years. These mountains, formed by vast geological forces, moulded and weathered by the elements, are like sculptures. Their massive forms suggest the firm contours of bronze, or the tough, creased hide of an elephant. Strange associations, but in many ways they bring to mind the look and feel of sculpture by Henry Moore. Sculpture, he has said, has something of the energy and power of great mountains. In the summer of 1972, the mayor of Florence invited Henry Moore to arrange an exhibition of his works in the buildings and grounds of the 16th century Forte di Belvedere, the fortress of Florence. It was designed in the shape of a six-pointed star. Its terraces dominate the city and the surrounding country. Accepting the invitation, Moore assembled in the fort and on the ramparts, which Michelangelo himself had helped to design, nearly 200 sculptures and 100 drawings. It was the story of his life. It was the largest exhibition of his work that there had ever been. Writing to the mayor, he said, my relationship with Florence grows, and I feel that it is my artistic home. No better site for showing sculpture in the open air and in relationship to architecture and a town could be found anywhere in the world. 
yet its architectural monumentality makes it a frightening competitor for any sculpture, so I know that showing my work will be a formidable challenge. In four months, nearly 400,000 people came from all over the world to see the exhibition. Nothing could have been less like the inhibiting atmosphere of a museum or gallery. The placing of modern sculpture in a setting of Renaissance beauty was a provocative act of faith. The mood of the visitors was easy and relaxed, for in Florence, art is taken for granted as a natural part of life. The citizens of Florence took the exhibition to their hearts and proudly put its exhibits to uses the artist had not foreseen. Sculptures were photographed as if they were film stars, religious relics or fashion models. At times, the terraces of the Belvedere had the atmosphere of a fairground or festival. It was a public pleasure ground, filled with movement and people and prospects of sculpture that continually changed with the time of day or the vagaries of the weather. In the Renaissance, Michelangelo had nothing worse to face than the patient and deferential Vasari the first biographer of the great artists of his time. Moore turned out in the rain to face television cameras and journalists with deadlines to meet and planes to catch. The great cathedral dome by Brunelleschi, the famous tower designed by Giotto, the museums and churches filled with works by Fra Angelico, Botticelli, Masaccio and Michelangelo all slipped by an out-of-focus backdrop to a modern artist in the news. The big sculptures in the open air, each one sighted by Moore himself, were what made this exhibition unique. One would have had to travel the world to see so much at any other time. This two-piece reclining figure is Moore's half-scale model for a work which stands in the Lincoln Center, New York. Oval with Points is one of his latest pieces. One edition of this is at Princeton University, America. This reclining figure, made in the 1950s, is the model for the much larger UNESCO figure which stands in Paris, carved from Roman travertine marble. Crucifixion form, bronze, 1955. The best known version of this stands on the top of a mountain in Scotland. Reclining figure, arch leg. One copy in California, another in Jerusalem. Torso, 1967. There are nine castings of this. There is such a demand for Moore's work that editions of six or seven are quite usual. King and Queen, 1952. There are editions of this in Scotland, London, Germany and New York. Square form with cut, 1970. Solid marble from Carrara. Declining figure, 1969. Another recent work, 9 Tel Aviv. Of course, Moore's sculpture could not escape comparison with the traditional glories of Florence so close at hand. It provoked argument and discussion. The exhibition was a paradise for the professors and the guides with their patient and attentive groups. They were led from explanation to explanation. Ritorna quel concetto di movimento ascensionale presente in tutta la sua ultima produzione che serve a rappresentare come lo spirito ancora si realizzi, ancora voglia elevarsi. Quindi è un concetto molto importante in quanto 
chi si fosse fatta un'idea di un pessimismo di Muara direi che sbaglia in quanto Muara è pessimista per, per quanto riguarda la materia, una materia che quindi a 70 anni lo sta abbandonando, ma invece ottimista, quindi ancora un muore che può produrre riguardo Most people go to Florence to see the masterpieces of the Renaissance. Many who climbed the hill that overlooked the town were caught unawares by this brave display of modern art. It was like finding modern furniture in an antique shop. I really feel that the true art is down in the city and uh, I I can't help but think that they they'd be like laughing at this and uh and thinking on what people are getting by these days and what they're settling for these days. In other words, if anybody, you know, in any painting that you see, you know, you, people see what they want to see in it. But I do wonder, like, uh, the fact that they have no names listed on them. I'm not saying that no names exist for them, but no, you know, they don't, they're not written on it. And it's all free form, but yet I don't see the beauty in it. You know, I thought the true beauty was down in the city, where there was uh, the purpose and beauty and, uh, i think in a city like this, uh, I think it's a goof. I think uh, that although the art in the city is beautiful, and that when you look at that, you get a feel of more classical, true art. When you come up here, you also have to acknowledge that it is, it is an ex a self-expression of an individual, just as Michelangelo's is a self-expression of an individual. And although they don't have the names on the sculptures, as such names do exist for them. and. It's just the difference of, of Renaissance and modern times, where this is people, you know, put their own interpretations in or try to interpret the expression of more himself. I, I resent a little bit when he takes the human form and distorts it, and that you still recognize the, the very human form or the human being uh, in a distorted form. Is when he leaves the, the, the body and... and makes it more abstract, you see the round forms, I, I think it, it becomes much stronger. Is it fiberglass? I didn't even know. It looks very much like stone to me, but maybe I'm, I'm no uh, specialist in, on uh, the sculptures. Um, I think it should have been stone. As far as an exhibit goes, just as an art exhibit goes, it's a fantastic exhibit, because they did a very good job and they did a lot of good for Henry Moore as far as the way they set it up. But the fact that I'm not a Henry Moore freak um, makes me a little less enthusiastic about it. <coughs> There's one over there where you look through it and you can see the dome in the background. And through seeing the dome in the background, this brings out the curved shapes in his sculpture. I think one needs, they need to be set outside. You need to walk around them and see them from every different angle, which you can do if you are inside, but I think uh, being outside, seeing the, the shapes against the shapes of the surrounding country, building, other buildings, um, other people, it does uh, bring out the shapes in them. Also, I get this great thing of going through them, because I think we both do dance, don't we? And yeah. When I'm looking at these, I tend to sort of mentally contort my body into the shape that these um, sculptures are, are making. I think the abstract ones, you can um, associate yourself, your own body, with the abstract ones more than the, the, the ones that are actually meant to be um, people. He doesn't like to um, put a, a, a sculpture in front of you, say, this is, um, this is a man, this is, um, this is a woman, this is whatever it is. Rather, he wants you to come with absolutely no preformed ideas at all. I always want to go up and touch them. <laughs> I don't know if there's any other thing in, in me, but you know, sort of, if you go up to them and you can sort of run your hand around them, which is what, I don't know, it's, it, to me it's very nice. Many people, as they explored the exhibition, were examining their own reaction to unfamiliar sights. They wondered how the old and the new could be compared. As they looked and walked around amongst Moore's sculptures, it was not easy to connect his work with the Renaissance tradition. Moore, as much as any artist of his generation, has been regarded as a symbol of the avant-garde, the man who made a complete break with the academic traditions. His long affection for Florence was unexpected. Yet Moore's connections with the city are important and go back surprisingly 50 years to 1925. In that year, 
At the age of 26, he was somewhat reluctantly in Italy and made these sketches of the Florentine countryside. He wrote home wistfully, I wish there was a tree with a proper trunk. He stayed in Florence for three months. He drew this sketch of the Arno in a break between visiting museums and churches. He too had to find for himself some connection between the work that he was then doing and the undeniable achievement of Renaissance art. When he went to Italy in 1925, this was the sculpture that he left unfinished in his studio. It was a squat mother and child. It owed far more to the forms of primitive art than to the classical tradition. He had been finding inspiration in places like the British Museum, looking at early Egyptian art and sculptures from Mexico. The originality of his own work caused a sensation. In Italy, he was in a dilemma, and his sketchbooks provide the evidence. They are filled with notes and sketches that he made there. These pages are amongst the earliest records we have of the workings of his mind. What one sees is a process of observation, discovery and research that ranges widely over the whole field of art. Just as he was gaining some notoriety for his daring excursions into modern art, here he was in Florence facing up to the masterpieces of the Renaissance and being forced to question his own values. Could he have foreseen that 50 years later his own work would be celebrated in Florence on equal terms with Michelangelo and Giotto, and on an even grander scale? What he saw in Florence was not a stylistic guide to his future, but a reminder of the mastery and the eloquence of form achieved by great men who were individuals. Renaissance artists were no longer anonymous craftsmen. It was their personal achievement that he admired. He wrote down a roll of honour and added a reminder to himself, remember the spirit of Masaccio. But it was almost in protest that I went uh, to Italy. And... Um, because I thought I knew, uh, which I didn't, I thought I knew enough about Renaissance art and Greek art, the old masters, the kind of um, uh, traditional art. And uh, I was fighting. It, it's like a, a, um, a young person trying to um, get free from the authority of his parents to live his own life, to live his own um, uh, outlook. Uh, and to begin with, when I got to Italy, I only looked at the very primitive things. Uh, Cimabue, or Duccio. And eventually I came through to Giotto. And then after Giotto, I uh, looked at Masaccio. But I avoided trying to see Michelangelo. I thought I knew all about it. And I had three or four months in Italy um, trying to avoid the um, uh, sort of Renaissance or trying to uh, find things that, that weren't taught in schools of art, uh, that, that weren't in the history of art books. And so, um, uh, but eventually I did come through to the um, Renaissance masters and I did look and copy uh, the drawings of Raphael and Michelangelo and so on, and looked at the Michelangelo sculptures, and I was quite rightly bowled over by it. No one in history, I should think, has driven themselves, has uh, been obsessed to that terrific extent uh, about sculpture um, uh, than, than Michelangelo. The Florence exhibition is now just a memory for Moore, a poster on the wall of his English studio. There is more work to do, more sculpture to add to the collection that packs his various workrooms to the walls. Where do his ideas come from? How does his sculpture take on the shapes and forms that it does, with so many seeming distortions and variations? To him, the underlying forces which sustain his stream of invention are largely subconscious. 
If one could see inside his mind, one would be aware of an enormous store of images, his vocabulary and dictionary of form. One studio in England is given over entirely to a collection of bones, fossils, pebbles, stones, flints, crystals, pieces of wood and root, natural sculptures of every kind. They're all mixed up with a regiment of small-scale models of his own ideas. It is hard to know where nature ends and art begins. This is the landscape of Moore's imagination a happy hunting ground where one can find in miniature the apparent sources of many of his ideas. On the shelves there are as many clues to Moore's creative interests as one could find in museums or in the history of art. The shape of things he sees in the natural world take on in his mind a human significance and these imaginative connections follow through into his work. Certain themes emerge and are adapted to his style. This broadening of the sources from which sculptural expression is born is one of the ways in which an artistic tradition can be continued and charged with a new life. A classical sculptor carving a Venus or an Aphrodite would not have described a woman's body the way Moore does. But in spite of Moore's emphasis on bulk and fertility, the subject is the same. His statements about it are new, forthright and challenging. For a sculptor, the grouping and the connection of several figures in a satisfying unity is a problem of supporting and balancing selected forms within a family of aesthetic relationships. The idea of family is a case where subject and treatment have a common purpose. Moore's family group is a statement both about people and about sculpture. He shows the relationships between father, mother and child, but it's not a religious work, not a holy family. It impresses itself on the memory because the sculptural treatment remains strong and alive. The forms have not been weakened by generations of repetition. Moore's king and queen disturb the conventional idea of royalty, the traditional photograph in the officer's mess. These symbolic figures of authority generate a feeling of power, but power of a special kind. The group seems to suggest a tribal or mythical image, touching some unconscious strand of memory. These two figures are archaic rulers of human destiny having almost magical authority.
fallen warrior is more than a casualty on the field of battle, more than a sentimental tribute to an unknown soldier. An academic sculptor might have called this figure Achilles. Moore has developed conventional themes such as the female reclining figure in many ways. The forms have double meanings. Drapery begins to look like the bark of a tree. It clings to the trunk of this woman's body which rises and swells like a hill. The head is a lookout post on the top. The mass of the body is supported on sturdy arms and legs. The heavy parts are weathered like ancient rocks. The lap of this earth mother could be the surface of the moon. Though the eye is beguiled by these associations, her womanly form is never forgotten. I think all sense of form is connected with the human figure. We only learn as children uh, that a thing is a certain distance away by reaching out to touch it. And one's arm's length and so on, your sense of, of, of smoothness and of roughness comes from touching. Uh, your, um, and it all depends too on the human figure. If we were uh, 20 feet high instead of only on the average six feet, then all our sense of size and scale would, would, would be different. If we uh, stood on four legs, like horses, like animals, our sense of balance would be all different. That is, it, the, the human figure controls architecture, sculpture, controls all our sense uh, of form. Our own uh, bodies are the most conscious part of our sense of form. If somebody touches you in a, part, in a place, you know where it is. Um, if somebody touches the wall, you don't. This is, I mean, our bodies are the, the, the whole uh, basis of, of, of uh, an understanding of three relation, of three dimensional uh, world. So um, the, human, uh, the human form, for me, is inevitable. And if people think they can um, go through life without being worried about the human figure and the human form, I think it's like somebody trying to go through life, like a painter probably trying to go through life, looking only at blue and never knowing any other color. We must know form. We must know the human figure. Until very recent times, sculpture has been limited to the appearance of the human body shown in outline or in solid mass. Moore has extended the tradition by finding within the human frame a multitude of analogies with landscape. He knows the earth as intimately as he understands the anatomy and the flesh. He was born in a mining community and like a miner he has burrowed beneath the surface of things, broken up solid masses and even separated them into parts.
At times, Moore's sculpture is almost abstract. Instead of rugged blocks and ridges, the surfaces are smooth and sensuous. This marble carving is called interlocking forms. Two pieces rest on each other, almost like bears at play. They form a tender embrace, a loving play of surfaces and light. Yet it is very firm and strong. There is no sweetness and sentimentality in the pleasurable shapes. It is directly sexual in feeling and form. The eye is continually attracted and intrigued. The inviting surfaces tempt the sense of touch. They hold and reflect the light as though they contained inner energy and power. Once, in a tremendous dome of polished bronze, Moore realized an image with a different energy and power. At one and the same time, this sculpture is both beautiful and threatening. It is called Atom Peace. A larger version stands in Chicago and is a memorial to the invention of the controlled release of nuclear power. Physical power and sexual power make a potent combination in some of Moore's more erotic sculptures. His largest bronze has an irresistible force. He calls it vertebrae. It is a tumultuous assembly that seems to express all the energy of life and creation. Moore would see no reason to express in words the sexual basis of art. The connections between art and sex seem to him to be hardly worth spelling out. The whole of life is, um, uh, is made up of the... Um, uh, I mean, if you want to look, if you, if, you, if you want to interpret form from this point of view, then... Um, Everything is, is a, a sex. And uh, the appreciation, uh, everybody's appreciation of form, is built on this um, uh, appreciation of sex. Uh, I think that my um, part of my early uh, training as a, as a young sculptor comes from being going to a, um, a mixed secondary school where. Um, I could look at all the girls' legs, all from the age of 12 or 13, and I could tell you in, in the school any, which girl was which if you'd only shown me uh, um, her figure from the knee downwards. This was, um, so this, I mean, this is a, uh, but it isn't that thing that you mean. I mean, the, um, the fullness of form, uh, the tautness of form, all these things are connected with life. And life is sex and so on. So um, it, it's not a um, uh, it's not a conscious uh, thing that you use your brain over. But it shouldn't be, in my opinion, in the sculptor's um, conscious aim to try and be um, uh, pornographic or sexy or so on. This would only make it uh, it would only make the work um, false and um, uh, chishi, and I don't know what. It would, it would, it, this is something, I don't think of such of, of things naturally. I mean, uh, a swelling, a, a big, full richness that has a connection with uh, one's childhood and the breast of one's mother and so on, all these things. The, um, uh, it's, it's just there, it's inevitable. In England, Moore's sculptures seem to grow out of the land as naturally as the trees and fields that surround them. 
They are boulders of imaginative creation that lie on the surface of the landscape. Nowadays, Moore likes to go big. A quarter of a mile from his home, he's even built a hill. It's a place to try out sculptures that can be monumental in conception. He has a studio for making full-scale models. The parts are cut out of 10-foot blocks of polystyrene. The bronze casts can be made from these in separate pieces, but before going this big, he will try out smaller plaster pieces on the hill. He discusses with his assistant how the forms can be related and he judges them against the horizons of the countryside. Once he could only probe the three-dimensional relationship of work by making numerous drawings. Now his ideas are worked out with models. He has given up drawing sculpture. He begins this one with maquettes small enough to hold in the hand. Here's a, um, a sculpture idea uh, made up of four forms that eventually get related to each other and make a, um, uh, a composition uh, between them. Now, um, to try and draw that will be absolutely impossible. Um, where, which, which view, which way, which form, uh, what would one do? Uh, Whereas in a small maquette of this size, each form can be handled very easily and quickly. I can look at it from every point of view. I can work on it with my uh, fi refining uh, tools and shaping. And um, whereas and then I can try them out so quickly and so easily in, the, in their relationship. Imagine if I had to do each of these and turn it over and, and uh, it's just ridiculous. I mean, this is undoubtedly the way to get into my mind the relationship from a three-dimensional, from every point of view that I, that I wish. Later, having got that general idea, I can then make a bigger version and um, uh, change that again. Then if I'm going to make even that uh, into a, a monumental size, I, eventually probably this will go on the hill outside. Uh, but uh, to make it in the monumental size, I can again change it. I can try it out in the... But this is a way of evolving and developing rather than uh, putting up with what happens because you can't um, uh, deal with it in that scale, in that size. Here I'm the master, complete master, like somebody uh, inventing. This can be any size in my mind that I like. It could be the... Um, uh, ten times the size of anything I've done. Ever since I saw Stonehenge as a young sculptor coming from Yorkshire, a young student really, and coming to the Royal College of Art, I made one of the first chips I made was to Stonehenge. Um, and I was impressed, uh, and have been ever since, by the kind of monumental um, power that it has. Also by the fact that it was made up of a whole lot it really is more sculpture than architecture. Moore has found a sculptural language which can be adapted to monumental scale. Even relatively small sculptures by him can dominate a scene. They catch the eye in the way a sentry might do on a battlement or a bird perched on a rock. Moore has always been intrigued by the mysteries of size. Once during the war, he made a well-known drawing of a crowd of people looking at a tied-up object, many times their own height. Thirty years later, the picture came to life. The tied-up object was unveiled. Square form with cut, Moore's largest sculpture to date, was carved from 30 separate blocks of marble. It weighs 170 tons. When assembled piece by piece, it stands 25 foot high.
locking piece, a huge bony elephantine form, gave the people who circled its bulk the feeling of sailing round a chalky headland or through a sea of icebergs. Just as the knee joints of the heaviest animals one could imagine would support immense weights, so this sculpture conveys a dour sense of mass and energy. Its bulk concentrates at the centre where the forms meet in an iron grip. Large arch is a piece of surrealist architecture as awe-inspiring as an ancient monument. It is an immense bony form, almost a pelvis or a jawbone. It is like a mouth or the entrance to a great cave. It forms a bridge between sculpture and architecture. Moore does not feel that he has broken with tradition. The principles of growth in culture as in life imply a continuity from beginning to end. It's time that does uh, uh, makes the difference. I mean, I'm now over 70. Uh, when I began 50 years ago, or 40 years ago when I first began exhibiting, then uh, it, it seemed that, that um, what I was trying to do was entirely unlike um, anything to do with tradition. It wasn't, because I was looking at, um, uh, at the British Museum and at sculptures which had not been considered in the tradition. That is, I was looking at primitive art, at Negro sculpture and so on, and not only at the Renaissance art. So that a thing becomes traditional after a time, that it's a... Uh, uh, what seemed revolutionary at one time. Now, if you look at Cezanne, Cezanne at one time was completely unacceptable and had no... Uh, now he's part of the tradition. You can't have something that stops. I mean, it's like saying, why well, is it necessary for science to go on? I mean, why can't we be satisfied with the flat earth theory or, or so on? This is the growth of human intelligence, sensitivity and so on. And this must change, this must... You can't go on just repeating. So there must be a change. Um, and sculpture and painting, uh, uh, the visual arts, are a few people, the practicing artists, are the ones who are devoting their lives and their one obsession is through uh, their art. And uh, if they don't make a change, then they're doing nothing. For centuries, people have come to Florence, just as people have travelled the world to visit religious shrines. It is a kind of Jerusalem or Mecca for the creative spirit in man. It is a place which exists as much in the imagination as in reality. It is a setting of ideal classical beauty, a birthplace of European tradition. Florentine art was noted for its grace and its beauty. But beneath the beauty lay a concealed power. The arts derived their noble proportions from an ideal of human proportion. Moore has altered these proportions and brought to an old tradition new insights which link the image of man to his knowledge of the natural world. Beneath the skin lies the muscle and the bone. The surface of the earth has been shaped by immense energies and powers Sculpture, standing larger than man, 
like totem or temple, approaches the threshold of magic. Perhaps in the 20th century, Moore has done what Michelangelo might have done had he lived in our own age. 